Alpha thing. I don't, I don't care what. That's not Still get it. Still gets it. And to send you as the Okay, good morning everyone. Before we get back into Martin Chemnitz in Caridian, official announcement is that Luther's works, lectures on Genesis chapters one through five, won the day. We are, um, you can touch base with Wendy, we can get a 15% uh, discount, more than that if we buy in bulk, um, but we're guaranteeing 15%. <laughs> so if you want that, um, submit to Wendy so we can make that order. And if we get up past a certain threshold, it jumps up to 20%. We'll, uh, we'll kick that back to you if we do meet that threshold. And as you're um, looking for this text, it is, a, it is some uh, 400 pages. Now that's not um, nearly 400 maybe 359. So we'll be looking at a different strategy as we go through this. Not every single um, word read here in class, but something we employed in previous classes with previous texts 
is something in the vicinity of 20, 20 pages. Just read it in advance. We'll all assign it in advance. And then we'll hit the main points as we go along. So that'll be our strategy for this. We'll hopefully move a little more quickly and just not get caught down into the details. But I'm excited to do this with you. It's going to be a wonderful text. As we jump back into the Enchiridion, we're going to be looking at the second part of absolution on page 134. We had spent a pretty significant amount of time last week on the first half, which really has to do with the keys and the biblical basis of absolution. And then talking about it in the macro sense of church discipline, corporate absolution. Today we'll pivot into private or individual absolution, question 285. But before we do, let's open with invocation and prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so as we look at question 285, of course it's uh, translated, what then is private absolution? Maybe just a, a tiny little nit to pick here. It is, of course, private, but that is to say the content of the confession is private. In fact, that's part of our ordination vows. But there's nothing private about an individual going to confession absolution. There's nothing to be shamed, ashamed about at all about Letting your face be seen walking in and out of the sanctuary for a confession of absolution. That's what every good Christian should be doing, or at least be contemplating. So this is a, a reason to have it be individual absolution as opposed to private, which kind of puts this whole cloak of secrecy. The content of the confession remains private, but not the fact that every Christian as an individual may come and confess. Okay, what is it? That's the question at the heart of 285. Let's get Chemnitz's answer. When a minister of the church, or in case of necessity, any Christian. Now, see, we talked about that last week, and that does indeed parallel how we used baptism. In an emergency or a case of necessity, a Christian may baptize. But it's not something they ought to do just, or look to do every day. Uh, and then the same logic applies to absolution. A distinction here, obviously, if someone sins against you personally, to absolve is only right and natural. If, Lord, if my brother sins against me up to seven times a day, should I continue to forgive him? I tell you not seven, but seven times seventy. So we are to continually forgive those who sin against us. But this is an altogether different question. This is the question of do you as a Christian interpose yourself between God and the individual? You, you haven't been sinned against anywhere in the transaction. Someone recounts to you how they've sinned terribly against some third party. And do you place yourself then between God and that individual who's made that confession and pronounce an absolution? Well, you may and indeed should in cases of necessity. But it's not something a Christian, you know, should probably, any, any more than I as a Christian would just sort of wake up and be like, who am I going to baptize today? <laughs> I'm not thinking like, okay, who am I going to absolve today? Um, but if the occasion arises, I want to be ready and well prepared. So, once more from the top, when a minister of the church, or in case of necessity, any Christian, sets forth the comfort of the gospel, not in general, obviously set it forth in general, but proclaims forgiveness of sins on the basis of the word of God privately, in particular to a sinner who seeks the grace of God in Christ, in earnest repentance and true faith, 
so that he absolves him of his sins in the name of Christ and pronounces him forgiven. Christ has promised to be present with his spirit. It's Christ's spirit, for those of you listening along, in this act. Uh, references given Matthew 28, uh, 18, 20, 28, 20, John 20, 22 to 23. He himself, that is Christ, also through this means, truly offers, gives, applies, and seals forgiveness of sins to a troubled conscience with the added promise that whatever is forgiven and loosed on earth in this way is forgiven and loosed also in heaven. References to 2 Corinthians 2.10 and Matthew 16.19. Chemnitz continues, but if one should diligently explain how much comfort comes to a troubled conscience from this, namely that I might know from this where I ought to seek and might find Christ my Lord, so that he might deal individually and separately with me, a very vile sinner, through the word, and I may be allowed to hear that very sweet statement and comfort as immediately from him, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins are forgiven thee, go in peace. Moreover, private absolution also affects this, that I have no need to dispute anxiously and with concern within myself what God thinks or decides about me in heaven, inasmuch as I can become the more sure about what matter, excuse me, about that matter through private absolution here on earth, so that I ought not doubt at all that it is valid in heaven also. And the Holy Spirit wants to be present in this very act and strengthen and preserve faith through the word. And for these reasons, private absolution is justly to be both exalted and often and freely used. Okay, so this is uh, a very common thing amongst Christians, sadly. And that is, uh, particularly late in life, one starts to reflect on the question of, am I going to go to heaven? And the answer that I, as a pastor, hear not infrequently is, I hope so. Now, it's not immediately to be condemned outright, but it does kind of raise a red flag, especially in light of what we just read. Where is the uncertainty coming from? Where is the I hope so coming from? And as Chemnitz points out in this line about, um, moreover, private absolution also affects this, that I have no need to dispute anxiously and with concern within myself what God thinks or decides about me in heaven, inasmuch as I can become the more sure about that matter through private absolution here on earth, etc. The point being, why would you be doubtful, and if you are, confess your sins and receive that absolution and believe that it is just as certain here on earth as it is in heaven? So that kind of takes the mystery away of, oh, I hope I'll be saved. Well, how about if we absolve you so you can know for certain? that you're saved and rest your salvation on the external outside of you and objective proclamation of the forgiveness of your sins. And then I think the last line too is worth pointing out because this is the Lutheran attitude toward this gift of Christ. Chemnitz writes, and for these reasons, private absolution is justly to be both exalted Luther says, when I compel you to go to individual or private absolution, I'm simply compelling you to be a Christian. Uh, so it is to be exalted and then often and freely used. So it's not a mandate in uh, the Lutheran church the way it is in Roman Catholicism, where at least once a year you need to confess, you have to confess your sins. And in that confession, you have to confess every possible mortal sin. If you leave one out, that one's left out. So, not good. Not so in Lutheran theology, because as we look at the scriptures, we don't see Christ putting in any asterisks or various bylaw references. 
but just simply bestowing this gift upon the church, that the church would use it frequently, often, and for the purposes of salvation. So I love that language, exalted and often and freely used. Okay, that's 285. Any preliminary commentary, questions, thoughts on that? Yes. Okay, we are running the microphone. Hang on one second. I was listening to a, a discussion of Christians, and I'd never heard this comment before. And then they went on to something else. Uh, but um, they said there's a difference between emotional and intellectual doubt. Okay. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, <laughs> I guess that sounds like a reasonable distinction. I guess that sounds like a reasonable distinction. Um, maybe, I don't know if this was the context in which you heard it, we just had the text of Doubting Thomas, and these kinds of uh, distinctions sometimes come up, reflecting on what kind of doubt Doubting Thomas had. And of course, it's been popular in preaching since rationalism and modernity to look at Thomas as some sort of like 20th century scientific skeptic. Unless I put my finger into his, you know, hands and my hand into his side, I'll, you know, some kind of materialistic skeptic. Uh, it's a little dubious and maybe a little anachronistic to read it that way. So what is the nature? And some guys will take a more hard line. Hey, this is just unbelief. This is just flat out rebellion. Um, and then others will tend to take a more emotional because on account of how quick he was willing to say, my Lord and my God, that it, and again, all of this is somewhat reading into the text, but I think in a good and pious way, I don't really have any problem. We read into the text all the time, as long as we're not malicious and manipulative about it. Um, that maybe, maybe he, he, he had his feelings hurt that he wasn't there and he missed out. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an interesting possibility that he, cut, you know, he goes to 7-Eleven to get everybody some Twinkies and Mountain Dew, and he comes back and they're like, the Lord was here, you missed it. <laughs> and he's, you know, like, what? I don't believe you. And, you know, he kind of gets emotionally upset about it. Who knows? Who knows? But um, I, I don't know if that's the context in which you heard that. I just have to say, too, in, in this age we're living in, yeah. where there's all kinds of stuff thrown against us, a few years ago, a woman who I knew as a Christian who openly expressed it, one day said to me, I don't believe Christ existed. Mm -hmm. And I just responded, we were doing something else. Mm. I just responded, well, then I guess George Washington didn't either. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Christ never existed. He's the most attested to figure in all of history. You've got to throw everything else out. Yeah. You know, I, there's, uh, there's more that, could, that probably should be said. I'm just not prepared to give a full treatment on it. But uh, maybe one final comment. And that is very often what presents as an intellectual objection to Christianity, in fact, isn't. Usually what's behind the intellectual rejection of Christianity, well, I've got this reason why I don't believe in God, is the fact that they want to do something sexually immoral. That's usually at the root of it. Not the, the intellectual is a facade and is an excuse and is a defense. And really what's going on is they want to put a body part where it doesn't belong. That's typically how it goes down. So fetching that out is important because you're probably not, otherwise you're not you know, really engaging with someone who's in, operating in good faith. So you can have this kind of intellectual, but very frequently what's underneath it is emotional, spiritual, moral. You can have this kind of emotionalism that's like, well, God, you know, Killed my mom when I was a little child, and so I can never love God again, that kind of thing. Um, and that, you know, that should be treated a different way. You don't sit down and say, well, let me give you a Quintus five proofs for the existence of God, right? You're dealing with an emotional uh, kind of thing. And so sometimes that's important. But sometimes the emotional itself becomes a facade. 
God has wronged me in this way, therefore I am justified in, and again, most frequently engaging in whatever uh, sexual malfeasance I want to. It's very frequently how it goes. Uh, the emotional thing is also used as a pretext. God hurt me, therefore I'm justified in living however I want, living as if God did not exist, which almost always comes down to the topic I keep mentioning. So those are some trends, some patterns. Does it fit always, every situation, every circumstance? No, um, but these are broad ways of thinking about this as you engage with people or as you listen to people. Okay, any other thoughts on this, uh, this tangent or anything uh, more directly related? Good, all right, let's jump into 286. Are then all to be equally absolved regardless, be they penitent or impenitent? Or is it in the discretion and power of the minister to bind and loose whosoever and whomever he will? All right, well, we've got a complicated twofold question there. To which Chemnitz just says, by no means. He continues, but Christ says, John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so also I send you. Namely, that you administer the keys of the kingdom of heaven, not according to your will, or as it seems good to the world, but according to the command and will of God. Therefore, whom God binds in his word, him the minister of the word also should bind. On the other hand, whom God absolves, him the minister of the word should, uh, also should pronounce forgiven. But where God himself does not bind or does not loose, there the minister also should not assume that power for himself. I don't quite know why that's a capital H there. But God does not absolve the impenitent and unbelieving, but binds them in his just judgment. It therefore remains also for the minister to use not the loosing, but the binding key against such people. On the other hand, God does not bind, but dismisses with forgiveness the sinner who heartily repents and in true confidence seeks the grace of God in Christ. The minister of the word should therefore do the same, not binding, but remitting sins to him. Okay, so in other words, just perfectly in keeping with the article of justification, which when put into practice is law and gospel, with those principles we talked about last week, how the impenitent I should be told that they remain in their sins and are bound in their sins, while the repentant, those who wish to be forgiven and want to do better, should be absolved and forgiven fully. Maybe at the, maybe at the root of this for us to at least consider would be how in the 20th and 21st centuries the pastoral office has become to see nothing has come to be seen as little more than the forgiveness office i'm the forgiveness guy i'm just shooting forgiveness everywhere well do you have any wisdom to give me no 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 that's the law i'm the forgiveness guy let me just blast you with some forgiveness so you know when you've got it when you've the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer everything starts looking like a nail <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've got, some, we've got some problems with that. And we've had some narcissists, I mean, very publicly abuse this uh, fault and flaw in our way of thinking as the pastoral office's atrophy did nothing but the forgiveness guy. You have very public sinners um, and manipulators who will go to the forgiveness guy, get forgiven, and then tout that to go on doing whatever they were doing in the first place. So it's just sort of a blanket uh, imprimatur upon them continuing on in their quote unquote ministry or pseudo ministry after they've already excluded themselves from this. Uh, frequently too, in narcissistic psychology, um, pastors who, who are just the forgiveness guys frequently tend toward that end 
of the spectrum themselves and it's virtually indistinguishable, psychologically speaking, from the practice of love bombing. So uh, you, you are rightly condemned by the church and or the world and or your family and or your spouse, whomever you sinned against. And rather than making right on that, you go to the forgiveness guy who love bombs you and now you become attached to him as a kind of, and you see him as a kind of mentor and you kind of see him as a sort of, uh, oh, the, the source of your salvation and the man to whom you're beholden and yuckety, yuckety, yuck. It's all, um, it's all very perverse, very isolated, very distorted uh, view of law and gospel, view of grace, view of the office of the keys. And unfortunately, it's very common. And we've had high profile people, uh, not just in the LCMS, but in the wider evangelical church. You can just about predict the pastor's discover it's discovered that the pastor's been having one or more affairs and he goes through this sort of mock stage of repentance, like, oh, I'll step down for a little bit. And then he's love bombed and forgiven by the absolution guy. And then he's welcomed back into the ministry, sometimes um, within a few months, sometimes within a few years, or, re or restarts his church. Anyone who says, you know, I don't think that's how that, that, how that goes, <laughs> is denounced by, by the absolution guy as being a Pharisee and a legalist and someone who doesn't understand the gospel. So these are the, these are the kind of perilous waters we've been in for some time, sadly. There's other symptoms that contribute, including the whole celebrity pastor deal. If there's a, beware of celebrity pastors, beware of online pastors. It's kind of a reason why the Lord gives you a call as a pastor to a specific congregation. Why you should spend most of your time serving that congregation. And why you shouldn't sort of announce yourself as pastor of the internet or something like this. All right, well enough on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I might be splitting hairs here, but I totally get the wisdom, the assurance, and the comfort when a minister tells someone that they're surely forgiven, mm -hmm. and you're actually just giving them the word. Mm -hmm. But I'm a little bit fuzzy about, is there any additional authority in that going to the key, someone who holds the keys of the church or is, there any, or is it just giving them assurance? Uh, so, no. So the position would be it is actually authoritative. So it is authoritative. Mm -hmm. so, so there is actually more, like, can, can that same authority be found in the scripture itself? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and be able to claim what the, what the Bible actually says? I know it's the, it's the minister's role to point out what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And if you are truly repentant, but um, you're definitely reassuring that believer. Uh, is there any additional authority that would be used in that role of a minister in that sense? Well, so the exercise of the office of the keys is categorically different than reminding someone of the objective fact of Christ's death for all sins. It is, in fact, a a first person absolution. So this, this taken from the line, so if you, well, let's look at it. But this is taken from John 20, where Christ says specifically, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. So it becomes this in the stead, in the place of, and by the command of Christ, I forgive you. So that I forgive you is mediating as communicative. Uh, it's, it's very much, so I think um, Chemnitz even cites this, the one who hears you hears me. So there is in fact a, a kind of authority there. And maybe to tease this out a little bit more, I can give uh, you know, a silly hypothetical. Let's look at the text first. So looking at John 20, uh, verse 21, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. 
So this has to do with the deeper Christology, of course, I mean, period, but maybe especially in John's Gospel, where Christ doesn't come to do his own will, but only the will of his Father who sends him. So Jesus, in this sense, is a man under authority and can only do that which the Father sends him to do. In the same way, he is placing his disciples under his authority, that they are to do only what he himself would do and have them do. So there's this sort of uh, transfer of authority would be one way to look at it, one way to frame it. Okay, and then uh, this is communicated to them in their, in their persons, in their office, receive the Holy Spirit if you, now it is plural here because he's speaking to a plurality, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. So let me tease this out with kind of a ridiculous hypothetical. But if you went to your pastor and you confessed your sins, and you did the general confession, look, I plead guilty of all sins, okay, et cetera, et cetera. And you said, these sins are what trouble me in particular. It's not the only sins I have. These are the ones that trouble me in particular. And he announces the forgiveness of uh, God to you. And as you're walking out of the sanctuary, you have a heart attack and you fall down and die. Okay, now, now you're standing before the Lord. This is the ridiculous hypothetical. You're standing before the Lord. And he says, he says, well, why should I let you into heaven? You could say, because you just absolved me. And he's, maybe he's being ornery. No, I didn't. Pastor Rody absolved you. Well, is Pastor Rody not... My pastor, is he not called by the church? Is he not authorized, according to your word, to forgive my sins? Is it not true that what is loosed on earth is also loosed in heaven? To which the Lord would have to say, come on in. <laughs> or else he'd be found to be lying. And he'd be found to be dishonest with the things that he's laid out and promised. All right, so a ridiculous hypothetical. We'd never expect Jesus to, to play that game with us. Um, but it does just illustrate the point, right, that, that it's not messing around. Jesus has authorized this and has called specific men into this office for a specific time and place. And we should view that as if uh, that's, they're the mouthpiece of God when it comes to absolution. And likewise, when it comes to the binding key, we should take that very seriously. That should, in fact, um, if that were to fall upon us, that should absolutely constrain our conscience and should absolutely uh, turn us around into repentance. Uh, does that help somewhat? Okay. Yes, sir. Um, you had said some time ago, I don't, fairly recently, um, that that was one of the reasons why uh, we use the vestments, so that what we're seeing is the office and right. not the man. Yeah, exactly. Um, and exactly. as an aside, we had a relationship when we lived in New Mexico with the uh, Methodist minister there, and he said what they used to do is they'd meet once a year, and they'd have to bring their whole kit bag because after the meeting, they were assigned out to a different church mm. so that every year the church had a different pastor. Oh. Mm. So that... <laughs> kind of a separate question of the wisdom of that. Yeah, yeah I don't it, know. It's, it was designed so that it's people office, didn't to have to strengthen the office as opposed to the individual connection. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure that that's how I go about it personally, but, I, but the principle does kind of hold... I mean, but it, but it even holds across other fields. I, I frankly don't want to go see a doctor that I personally know. I, I want a doctor to be in his office as doctor. I, I don't want to go to a lawyer and have a lawyer defend me who I have a personal relationship with. It entangles things. There's emotions involved. There's maybe a skewing of perspective. I want someone who is just cold, hard, factual, going to do the absolute best job they can do for me. Um, you know, but I think that this kind of translates across the board. I'd, I'd rather have somebody fix my house who I don't really know. That way, if they do a bad job, I can yell at them. <laughs> uh, teasing a little there. But, but there is this kind of um, importance of objectivity and importance of an office and a quote-unquote professional relationship or, or, I mean, that's not the case of the pastor, of course, but I'm just talking about these other fields. 
um, that is really there. It's baked into vocation. It's baked into our inner relationships as a kind of guarantee of objectivity. That's important. It's important. So um, personal relationships are wonderful and valuable and everything else, but of course in America everything's become personal and relationshipy and schmoozy and odd. And that has to do ultimately that we hate hierarchy and we hate the concept of office and this much to, uh, much to our detriment. Please. Simple question. With the new covenant, we're told that we can go directly to Christ mm -hmm. for all absolution. So is private absolution just a little extra personal assurance, or how would you answer that? I wouldn't look at it like that at all. I'd look at it as categorically entirely different. Um, so whenever we start to pit one gift of God or one aspect of salvation against another, uh, we run into problems. So you could, a similar argument can be made, well, I'm saved by faith and I have faith, so what do I need to be baptized for, right? First of all, Jesus says to be baptized. So just take it at that. Uh, Jesus gives the gift of baptism. Just take it at that. And then the same thing would be true. I can confess to God, true enough. Um, but Jesus gives you this gift. And I don't think he gives it in vain. So we ought to just take it in at that, at that sort of face value uh, level first and foremost. But secondarily, there is even ontologically something very different going on. When I confess my sins at night before I go to bed, I don't hear a pastor's voice saying, upon this your confession, I by virtue of my <laughs> right, I just have to sort of self-apply. And that's, that's okay, nothing wrong with that, but maybe there, there, there are many, and so, there's rationale for why God gives you a gift of hearing an objective voice of an officer of, in the church of, of the one whom he's called into the office. And when we could span those out, I mean, there's, there's multiple. Just off the top of my head, the externality, the objectivity. Um, if confession and absolution are frequently used in the history of the church as part of spiritual discipline. It becomes harder, you know, it's really easy to confess your sins to God every, oh yeah, well, I yelled at my dog again, oh yeah, I was rude to my wife again, you know, that whatever the sins are, I'm being kind of silly here. Um, but whatever it is that's on your conscience that you, and, and just sort of dismiss it into the ether, and you never really hear any response, there's not really any objectivity to it, and so you just sort of live in this continuous pattern. It's an altogether different thing when you walk to church and you, and I know this because I've been, because I've confessed my sins. I, you, walk, you park your car and you walk up the way and you sit in the pew and then you hear your mouth saying out loud, these are the things I've done. That's an entirely different animal. And frankly, that's why confession absolution isn't very popular. Because <laughs> the old Adam doesn't like to be mortified. He doesn't like to be put to death. He doesn't like to feel ashamed. So um, that's a very different exercise, ontologically, um, qualitatively, than just sort of, you know, as you drift off to sleep, being like, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry for this, you know. Uh, very, very different. So then the absolute, so the confession is by, by nature very different, uh, and then the absolution is by nature very different. I mean, and here, here so it can be used as regular sort of regular health checkups, part of your spiritual discipline and spiritual growth, but then um, especially as you get entangled in more severe temptations that come along. So uh, temptations that really, and not every Christian experiences these, of, of course, but temptations that really sort of strike at the heart of, um, well, are you a hypocrite? Is your faith a sham? Do you in fact not have faith? And those, those, become, those kinds of temptations can become almost equally perilous when you try to give an answer and defend for yourself. Okay. So obviously one of the well-known, well-worn uh, category, categories of danger in the Lutheran church is that as soon as you sin, okay, Satan will try to ply you one or two ways or even flip-flop you between the two. And one is, uh, no, you were right to do. Or what you did was maybe wrong, but it was pretty right. Okay. 
Oh, it may, yeah, you should maybe confess it, but it's not that big of a deal because look at all the mitigating circumstances. Just form of self-righteousness, self-justification, which if he can get that going and get that fire stoked, it just will keep going. Uh, but then the flip side is uh, despair. Well, you're a hypocrite. Well, you couldn't possibly, no Christian could possibly do that. Well, you must be the worst Christian that ever existed, if you are one at all, and so on and so forth, and to drive you into despair. And again, he's had thousands of years to perfect this art. And so he can manipulate and push and pull and do all kinds of different, different things and can upset and befuddle your conscience and uh, your, your inner man to a point where um, you can have, start having other problems that really, uh, whether you're cognizant of it or not, or to one degree or another, um, start to manifest elsewhere in your life. So to be able to go to um, confession absolution and say these are the particular dynamics and the particular circumstances and what I'm thinking, and I think this is sin, but I'm not sure, what do you think, can be an invaluable asset to have somebody objective and external to you giving diagnosis and giving treatment and giving cure, uh, that can be exceedingly helpful. And then likewise, um, confession absolution, what got twisted into the system of satisfaction and penance, which is rightly denounced, hey, you have to do all these things to make up for uh, the guilt of your sins, or at least the temporal guilt of your sins. Um, you know, that, that was rightfully done away with uh, by the Reformation. But what the Reformation never did away with and never intended to do away with was the kind of constructive help of like, hey, you know there are other, there are other people who have dealt with these sins in other ages. You're not the first one to ever deal with depression or you're not the first one to ever deal with addiction or you're not the first one to ever deal with anxiety. These things are universal and have gone on. And the church fathers have had many, many things to say, and the scriptures themselves have many, many things to say that you might find of specific importance and help. So then confession absolution can also entail a kind of uh, help where, what do I do now? Okay. What do I try? How should I think about this? How can I avoid this in the future? Uh, it's miles away from penance or satisfaction. It's part of the heal and cure. And that's still like a forgotten, dusty treasure that uh, needs to be dusted off and needs to be restored in the Lutheran Church especially. So those are all some reasons and rationale for why one would go to confession absolution as opposed to just say, well, I, you know, kind of half-heartedly confess my sins to God every so often. What's the difference? And I'm just not afraid to kind of put it in this blunt way either. Confession and absolution, like so many things in the church, is what you, get, what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. It's all given as a gift, but if you use that gift, if you enjoy that gift, if you play with that gift, if you use that gift according to its purposes, you're going to enjoy that gift and benefit from that gift way more than if you just said, oh, thanks, and set it on the shelf. I mean, in both cases, the gift is still given, but in one case, it's given in an extremely profitable way, and in another way, it's given just in a very superficial way. It's still a blessing, but yep, there it is up on the shelf. It's the toy I never play with. Um, it's the thing I never use uh, versus the thing I play with all the time and use all the time and love and enjoy. Okay, anything else we want to touch on before we hit? looks like 287. Yes, sir. I have a, a general question, I guess. Um, given that it seems like, well, I'll just speak for myself, there's a tendency to, to want to, in Scripture, anytime Jesus addresses his disciples or anyone, to assume that there's something in there that he's addressing to me. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess maybe it's two questions. Number one, are there places where that might not be true for a layman, being a layman myself? Mm -hmm. And then... Specifically, in uh, verse 22 and 23 there that you were reading from John 20, mm -hmm. um, does that apply to Laman? Or to what extent does that apply to Laman? Where he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. Mm -hmm. So 
I think, I think the most helpful general way, and this is somewhat con controversial, okay, there's, there's some disagreement over this, or is it emphasis or emphasis or whatever, okay, but I think this most simple way to look at this is when Christ gives and institutes baptism at the end of Matthew, and he says, baptize all, or make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them. He's giving that to the church which has within it a ministry. There's no such thing as a church without a ministry or a ministry without a church. So I think he's giving it to yes, <laughs> right? And I think that this is the true way in which the confessions speak. Our Lutheran confessions frequently say that he gives these gifts to the church. We sometimes read those through a 20th century lens thinking that he gives them to the church and not the ministry. That's absolutely insane. It's just completely insane. He gives them to the church and the church always has a ministry and the ministry always has a church. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's just sort of, I know that doesn't answer your specific question maybe yet, but that's baseline, is it's given to all of us. Now, gifts that are given corporately and to all of us are then exercised through the corporate or public office. That's the office of the ministry. So, I'll give you an example with the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is given to the entire church. It's given to all of us. That doesn't mean it's given to me individually. I can't just decide in my living room one night, you know what, I'm gonna have the Lord's Supper. It was given to all of us, it's given to me, it's mine to use. And no, for the very reason that it was given to all of us. It's the family gift. It's given to the family, not to individuals, right? So then how does the family exercise that gift through the office of the holy ministry? And that's where, um, you know, even, even things like stewards of the mysteries of God or the texts that really spell out what the pastoral office is and this distinction start to make clear that these gifts of Christ, baptism, absolution, the Lord's Supper, are given corporately to the church and then exercised through the church's office of the holy ministry. Make, make sense so far? Yeah. So then you get Chemnitz saying, like um, at, at the first line answer of 285, when a minister of the church, there we're thinking one who holds the pastoral office, or in a case of necessity, any Christian. See, so it's normative for the corporate gifts, at baptism, absolution, the Lord's Supper, to be administered through the office. Uh, when necessity arises, any Christian can exercise those. I mean, particularly baptism and absolution, because those are the, when there's an emergency, those are the things required. There's never really an emergency where the Lord's Supper is required, <laughs> despite people trying to invent these. There's not really one. Yeah, so does that help somewhat at least give you kind of a framing for how that, how that works? Yeah, it does. Should I just think, well, that's not actually applying to me since I'm not in the office of the pastor? Or Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that's my question. Okay, so there's in, I mean, again, you have, like, look at verse 19 of John 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. So you know there's the disciples there. Now, where you see the disciples, I think you should see church and ministry. So church and ministry combined. He's giving it to his disciples. Um, he's not giving it to one of them. He's not giving it to them individually. He's giving it to church and ministry. So then as this continues to sort of grow and take shape and take form in reality, in history, you start to see then this corporate gift given to the church executed through the office of pastor. And then where necessity arises, a Christian can baptize, a Christian can absolve, uh, frequently with, with report to the church, report to the pastoral office that this, that this took place so that follow-up and care can be given. So I think when you say, like, if you just were to say, who is the you plural in 23, the answer is the disciples. Well, who are the disciples? Church or ministry? I mean, they're believers in Christ, but are they church or ministry? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I guess that's my question. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that takes us to 287. All right. But how will the minister of the word become clear regarding the true repentance and faith of a sinner? Answer, for that reason and for that purpose, examination and exploration in private confession is observed in our churches with those who seek absolution and are about to approach the table of the Lord. So obviously in bygone eras, there was a much more rigid, maybe may be faithful, use of confession and absolution and examination in particular, like where Paul will say, let a man examine himself in preparation for the Lord's Supper. In some instances, even in this country, it manifested itself that you came to announce for communion on Saturday and part and parcel of that. Is, it, so like as best as I can picture it, in our sanctuary, the pastor would be in the front and everybody would be sort of stretching out in a line from the narthex and the patio and would sort of either come in individual by individual or family by family and there'd be a kind of uh, examination that takes place. Now, that's pretty time consuming. And so you can see reasons and rationale for why it became perfunctory and then ultimately sort of fell out of use, especially in our fast paced society. But that just gives you a kind of flavor for a concrete application of this in the not so distant past. I think the, the drive home point here would be that <clears throat> a, a, having a pastor examine is, is probably pretty intimidating. And for that reason, we largely don't. Um, but it certainly is at our disposal to use. And so how would I go about examining someone? Well, very generally with the Ten Commandments. So what is, now again, I'm not asking you for like, in this hypothetical, for a plenary confession of every last sin you've ever committed in thought, word, and deed. We'd never get out of the place. But what do you know and feel in your heart. What troubles you if we were to look at the first commandment? Maybe you'd say nothing really troubles me. I confess the creed. I have a good conscience toward God. I don't, you know, obviously in a general sense, I don't fear, love, and trust him the way I should. Okay, but that's not really where my conscience is accusing me. And you get on down the road and then it's like, okay, well, you hit the seventh commandment and you're like, you know, I didn't do my family right on this deal. And it's, it's kind of eating at me and, um, you know, but I'm doing X, Y, and Z. What do you think? Is this, is this the right thing? Is this the wrong thing? You know, that's the kind of way that um, examination can uh, work. I'm just trying to give you a, a concrete example. I know that's, well, hopefully it's more helpful than just being completely abstract. But that kind of examination. Um, what are areas, are there areas in which you're discontent? Well, sure, X, Y, and Z. Well, what's the nature of that discontent? Do, are, there, are there aspects of your, of your life, of your vocations, your relationships that are dysfunctional? To what degree are you culpable for that dysfunctionality? Those would be examination type questions and others. Okay, that's what 287 is getting at. And of course, I, um, the small catechism encourages us to examine ourselves in um, our place in life, our vocations, according to the Ten Commandments. Uh, 288. But the auricular confession of the papists is, at least in my opinion, null and void as a miserable torture of conscience and all out of harmony with the word of God. So this is... Uh, not particularly a question, just a statement that's going to be addressed here. Chemnitz's answer. The teaching of the papists regarding confession has chiefly three errors that conflict with the word of God. First, that in it there is required a full and express enumeration of each and every sin in the presence of a priest. I mean, could you, that would be torture. Do you, any of you seen the movie Goonies? Darn it. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Great, great scene in, like, these, these criminal people have captured this kid who's just a riot. 
and they're telling him, you know, he needs to give up where his friends are hiding. And, and they keep saying, you know, they keep putting the pressure on him and telling him, you know, tell us everything, tell us everything. And finally he breaks and starts this like tearful confession of sins. <laughs> It's so great. It's so great. And the criminal people just want to know where his friends escaped to, not like, <laughs> it's, it's such a great scene. Yeah, so I always think of that. All right, so anyway, um, yeah, this, uh, the, that it is required that a, uh, a full and express enumeration of each and every sin in the presence of a priest, that's an error. No, this is not a torture. This is not a memory test. Kenneth continues with this notion added that the sins that are not recounted to the priest cannot be forgiven. So there's the real blade that is operant in this error that cuts is like, hey, if you leave one out, it's not forgiven. Oh, horrible. Got to confess everything. I mean, that's a memory test more than anything, isn't it? At some point in time, you start pleading guilty to all kinds of things. Just like Chunk and Goonies. All right, second, that it is taught that by this work of confession, or by this recounting of sins, the one who confesses merits forgiveness of sins. Yeah, the, and that's, that's rightly condemned as an error. So this isn't, doesn't, confession absolution doesn't have anything to do with meriting or earning anything. At least of all the idea that, hey, by virtue of the fact that I'm confessing, I've sort of made myself right in God's eyes. Wrong way of thinking about it, and a grievous error. Okay, third, that this recounting of sins is demanded of them for this purpose, that those who hear confession might, as spiritual judges, impose on those who make confession fitting and sufficient satisfaction <clears throat> by which they might atone for and expiate their sins according to the measure of their offenses. Since all these things rest on no scripture foundation, but diametrically conflict with it, therefore that auricular confession of the papist is justly rejected and abrogated in our churches. Okay, so the, so the confessor who you go and confess your sins to isn't saying there's a spiritual judge who's going to assign you various penances or satisfactions. Um, that's not to say that there might not be correctives bear fruit worthy of repentance, um, but that's altogether a different category than penance or satisfaction. <clears throat> so like if you steal a whole bunch of money and it's like, okay, well, I can proclaim forgiveness to you, but you should return the money. That's not a satisfaction or a penance, is it? It's just bearing fruit worthy of... Or, hey, you know, if you're confessing that you've got a mistress and you're truly sorry and want to be forgiven, you're going to cut it off with her, right? Like, this is the end, right? Uh, is that a penance? No. Is that a satisfaction? No. Is that bearing fruits worthy of repentance? Yes. Should that be required? Well, if it's not, the repentance is kind of a sham, isn't it? And then it just becomes, please put your stamp of approval on my behavior, or I'll just keep on doing this with, the, with your assurance that I'm forgiven for doing this. Doesn't work that way. Okay, any thoughts then on the papistic errors enumerated there in question 288? Yes, sir. Oh, microphone's coming, hang on. Didn't you used to be able to purchase indulgences for sins you planned on committing? <laughs> that's the way I, I heard it yeah. in, in confirmation Well, in that sometime. system, it doesn't Maybe. matter. That's the thing. Even if they don't crassly come out and say that, the, logic, the inner logic of the system itself necessitates that reality, that possibility. So you can still buy indulgences, of course. I mean, modern Rome sells indulgences. Um, they, they frame it and contextualize it and make it seem not what it is. Uh, but the inner logic of it is still there and still obvious to anyone who's paying attention. And right, with the whole idea 
that you can, so I think we touched on this when we talked about the sacrifice of the mass, that you can sin, not be sorry for your sin, offer a sacrifice, pay for a sacrifice of the mass, so the sacrifice is made, and that sin is taken care of, completely apart from any change in your heart, any true repentance, any faith in Christ's forgiveness, any amendment of life, just transactionally, I did X, I'll pay for Y, Y will cover X, I'm clean in God's eyes. That same crude transactional logic uh, is, is at the heart of indulgences. Yeah, it's just un inescapable. So then in theory, why couldn't you? You know, if, you're, if your slate was, at, it was totally clean, if you were sitting at, uh, you know, maybe just, just right at zero, you're not in the black or in the red, why couldn't you make a purchase? And then you're in the black, and then when you actually do your sin, you just drop back down to zero, right? Not good. Okay, well, uh, this next section um, will be the end but it's longer than I want to try to force us through. So let's just stop a few minutes early today. We'll finish Confession Absolution next week, and we'll almost certainly be able to jump right into prayer. The Lord be with you.